Hello and welcome to today's Arthritis Wellness Conversation. I'm Sandra Sova, and as always, I am joined by a research scientist from Arthritis Research Canada and members of the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. Joining us today is Deanne Lakai, Scientific Director and Senior Scientist at Arthritis Research Canada. And from the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board, we have Trish, Nikki, Philippa, Chris, and Carrie is joining us today as well. The topic today is the stigma associated with having a chronic condition or being differently abled and as well the desire to move from the stigma to having more dignity. Trish, you described it so well in one of the conversation pieces that prompted this. And I was wondering if I could read that out to sort of set set the stage. So this is from Trish and talking about the stigma around arthritis. Arthritis stigma is first and foremost an external phenomenon in that is the judgment from others that devalues the person living with arthritis. Secondly, this stigma is often internalized by the person living with arthritis. It's a vicious cycle. Arthritis stigma persists despite being the number one cause of disability in Canada. When first diagnosed with arthritis, I was embarrassed and struggled in silence, not suffered. I think that there is an implied stigma and shame around people thinking that arthritis is just an old person's disease. And if I say I have it, it implies that I'm old. The fact is that 60% of people living with arthritis are under the age of 65. It is not an elderly disease. And I think that while that was so well said, um, well written, Trish, and I think while there are a lot of other aspects of that, that that is a big one. And I thought that a good place to start this conversation might be speaking about language. Language is so very important, and it's been in the forefront in a lot of different areas with how we interact socially and how we are being inclusive. And Trish, I liked how you had also said that the importance of using appropriate terminology and avoiding potentially offensive terminology. And some people may have even thought, thought about that. So can, we, can you speak to that a little bit? I guess with my previous experience in the arthritis community, I heard people living with arthritis described as crippled, um, that we suffer. Um, there's a lot of negative terminologies. Um, and then, you know, you kind of think, how do I get through today? And I have to think about the positive, right? What I can do, not what I can't do. So I stopped choosing that I suffered from arthritis. And I said, I was a person living with arthritis. And I found that empowered me um, because I didn't want to be labeled as crippled or handicapped. There's a lot of different words out there that I've heard over the years. And I think it's changing that dialogue is really important um, so that we feel that we're not labeled by our disease. Philippa, I'm going to um, call on you, you next. You talked about this as well as just having changing wordings and, and, and awareness. Where does that land for you? It's true. If I can describe what I live with and use those words in various situations, then it gives uh, people the opportunity to take up those words as well. Um, so instead of maybe... Uh, saying disabled, or as Trish said, crippled. If I say I'm living with uh, a chronic condition, uh, which happens to be arthritis, then it gives people the opportunity to take up those words as well and view others with arthritis in a similar way, using more positive wording. Mm -hmm. And I think as with anything else, like we we are responsible to educate people and how to communicate and treat us on, on all levels. And so this is a really great opportunity to change that narrative. Um, I was going to say as well, and, and, and this is what I wrote back to you, is that rather than labeling somebody, we say, I refer to myself, I am a person, uh, so I'm not disabled. I don't use a general terminology. I am a person living with a condition. Uh, so I'm not just all arthritis. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I have many other things as well. So true. Another section that we talked about was 
issues that we ourselves have in feeling sometimes uncomfortable in having to modify the way that we do things, or if we're using mobility aids, and that there's just a little bit of a, a little bit of a struggle with that. Nikki, you and Chris both brought up the issue around shaking hands. So that is in normal circumstances, that's a pretty, a pretty standard way of greeting. So what sort of things came up for you around that aspect in your workplace? Um, so for myself, initially it was it was pretty challenging because there were some days that I just didn't say anything and I kind of just put myself through the pain of having to introduce myself and use my hand that day and then eventually I started to pretty much try and own it and say okay well today I have sensitive hands and so I might explain it to someone while doing the handshake or I would just introduce myself and say could you be a little gentle with my hands as I have an illness and then they'd come into my office and sometimes people would probe and sometimes people wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And the challenging part was having to kind of, instead of getting right to business, it was sometimes a little bit of an education series of me having to explain my illness. And then they get the stigma. Oh, you're so young. How do you have arthritis? That doesn't make any sense. And so Mm -hmm. that was the challenging part. Now, Chris, I noted from from you that you were already using a strategy for hand for handshakes, but you still found the com- the comments coming your way. What was that like? Yeah, I kind of felt like a, a sly strategy sometimes. But uh, I could I work in the office and I have customers come in, and um, I don't know, maybe maybe it's a little bit different uh, being male as well because you you want to present like a, a manly handshake, right? Like a firm firm grip and everything, and. And, uh, you know, customers are coming right away with the handshake and, and I would have almost no time to kind of react. So I, I do a forearm shake, right? I go past, past the arm and shake the forearm. Sort of like up like this. Yeah. 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 So of course I'd have to explain that. I said, well, you know, I have arthritis and my, my it's very painful. I shake hands and that kind of derails the conversation a little bit. Like they come in for business and then we're talking about arthritis and it's a little bit of disbelief I usually get. Uh, because I, I look, uh, you know, middle-aged and healthy, but uh, I can't manage a, a normal handshake, right? Like both of you said, it sort of takes the, you're there for a business or professional transaction. And now all of a sudden it's turned very personal on you. Mm-hmm. And it's, it sort of can take, take that, that tone. So that's just, I mean. Yeah, I wish the, I wish the elbow bump was, was uh acceptable back then a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. As I mentioned as well, sometimes people feeling a little bit of awkwardness, hesitation, shame or embarrassment with having to use mobility aids. And I think that can be real a real thing. And I want to ask some people their opinions on that. But but Philippa, I thought I'd, I'd uh, stop in with you again, because I thought you had some really great thoughts around mindset and some creativity in there as well to bring some fun to it. Can you um, share those with us? Uh, well, I, I think first and foremost, um, in order to be comfortable with what you need in terms of um, assistive devices, is to go through whatever grieving process that we do when we know that we we have um, a condition and one that is probably lifelong and chronic. So whatever grieving process we go through, that loss of health and the loss of what our, we thought our future would be, if we can go through that and become come to a place where we get uh, acceptance of the condition that we're in, then we become more comfortable with, with using the devices that we need and uh, using them to make our life more comfortable, less pain-free with more balance. Um, and so one of the, the things I, I thought, and I don't use a cane or a wheelchair, um, uh, on a regular basis, but is to own it, to make it your own, um, paint it, paint it in the colors that you want it, uh, call it a different name. If, if you're uncomfortable with the word cane or the word wheelchair, um, and, you know, the things that I thought that my mother actually used when she needed a, a wheelchair just when she became frail, uh, frail with age is that she called her her magic chair. Um, so uh, putting it in a positive term, that, uh, 
that again, people can also hear the words that you use for it and, uh, and take that up. When I hear you say that, the feeling that I, that I, that comes to me is that if we're having fun with it, if we're showing, we're accepting it, we're not bothered by it. So you don't need to be bothered by it either. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of a, sort of a confidence thing. I am. I'm like Philippa. I used to, when I was using a cane, I would decorate it or have like little ribbon on it. And what I also found was that it also invited a conversation. So instead of somebody just looking at me going, oh, why, why does she have a cane and what's going on? Um, people could make a comment and then they could normalize it. And so it assisted me to normalize it with them without anything being awkward. So that was um, definitely a technique I used. And um, then just going back to what you were talking about earlier about the handshake. So I've been doing fist bumps for years and totally because I don't want anybody squeezing my hand. And, uh, and I would just start out with, so like Chris, when I would have somebody come in and I was in a professional situation, I would just come in and I would just go, you know, when they reached for it, I would just go, Hey, I'm all about the fist bumps. And, and then I would just kind of like smile and do that. And then they would go like that. And then we would move on and it never had to get, personal or anything it was just about me expressing me being a little bit different and hey I love fist bumps and smiling and making their fist bump okay too and then away we go so mm -hmm. that was how I handled that and I understood what Philippa said about grieving because I was diagnosed in my early 30s um, and for years I was in denial well quite a few years and then finally I went through that grieving process and I started to accept it and then I looked for assisted devices that looked more sporty and that's just me because mm -hmm. I've got an athletic background so I found walking poles so I I use the walking poles more than just walking I use them quite often um, and no one says anything and I just find I sometimes don't want to engage with people and kind of explain so I find for me that was my way of just dealing with my arthritis still staying functional, getting active, doing things, but I kind of went the sporty route. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was just me because it just helped me um, kind of move through that. So, but um, it was a bit to get uh, through denial and grief. I think that's a valid, uh, a valid piece as well. And the, the key is if we can have the, the skills, the resources and improvement of health to be able to move past that and not to stay in that state to become empowered and we much of this makes me think that we are actually being able to cha make create change and outlooks chris in the workplace you talked about using using the different desks and stretching and sometimes how that you maybe felt a little awkward but maybe you're teaching people of how we should all be in the office yeah, it uh, takes some patience and because uh, everyone has questions and um, because you're used to sitting on a chair and, and instead I'm sitting on a Swiss ball and of course I've got this big ball in my office when people walk in and, and uh, if they catch me off guard, I might be in the middle of a stretch or something, right? So, so yeah, it takes some patience and uh, a sense of humor definitely helps. Mm -hmm. I might have to take a break in order to add some air to my to my chair <laughs> I really think that um, nowadays with workplace assessment and ergonomics and you know um, I'm seeing more sit stand desks I'm seeing a lot of more ergonomic trays for computer stands and heights and chairs and we actually have um, a sit ball in a kind of a base in our office and I some people will grab it for an hour or so and then it's put away for a side and then somebody else grabs it for a bit but um, I'm seeing that more of kind of the normal equipment now part of our daily lives instead of it being a rare thing and going why do you have that stand sit desk but yeah. they're becoming more common. Yeah I, I agree I think the trend really in the workplace now is towards a lot of that those more ergonomic ways and in, in from what we've heard from people in our research and employment, people are a lot more comfortable using these things if they know that other people are using them and it becomes the norm. And you can also be an agent of change that by doing this, it those are things that benefit to others as well. And uh, so it has a, a more positive connotation uh, to it. Um, but I agree, I mean, the the, it's, it's very nice to see how this is really 
completely evolving in the workplace and, and becoming more the norm. So I think people can feel a lot less self-conscious that this is something that only they need and that it is showing a sign that they are less able and rather uh, portraying this as something that is healthy for everyone uh, and, and that they are setting a good example of, use, of using or doing something that is healthy, not only for them, but for everyone. I think that leads nicely into the next area that I wanted to talk about, which is sort of our role. I mean, each of us here are definitely involved in our, in our own health and wellness. So how do we go about creating understanding and awareness and moving past that sort of judgment and pity? It's not uncommon for us when we do disclose that we have a condition, especially for those of you here on the panel that are, are, are younger, for people to feel sorry for us. And that's, that's not empowering. Well, I think for me is everybody living with a chronic disease um, can deal with those types of questions differently. And I think for me is I like it when someone asks, can I help you instead of assuming that I need help, that they just jump in and try to help me. And I'm very independent and I like to do things myself, but then there's times I will ask, but I think I like it when somebody approaches me and says, "Um, is there something I can help you with? Um, And they kind of start the engagement conversation that way. Um, I find I get a little tense or upset when somebody wants to do something with for me and I'm wanting to be independent. Um, So I find that's a struggle sometimes is, but trying to engage with them and trying to get them in a conversation and understanding um, where I'm at. And also too is I find, you know, most people living with chronic disease, one day could be rougher than the next and next week it could be good. And then, you know, in a few weeks it could be, you're struggling again, um, just kind of going through a flare. And I think that's the biggest challenge is when somebody sees me very able-bodied and running around doing things and a couple of days later really struggling, they kind of don't understand. And a lot of it is, is opening that dialogue and that conversation to engage them in that conversation. Because if we don't, then um, if we put up a wall, if we were stubborn, um, that doesn't really help the situation. So mm-hmm. I've learned over the years to really engage in conversations. And if somebody asks me, they can help me. I've become more gracious in refusing them or accepting Mm -hmm. them. So I think that was part of my inner strength as well as trying to work with external, you know, judgment and, you know, people feeling sorry for me. I really like what I'm hearing on how that we can be presented with these situations where we are feeling that people are judging us or looking at it a certain way, but then we become empowered to change that, to shift this situation, to, to change the focus and become, show up with a more empowered way and to be, to be basically educating. Nikki, you also mentioned that it can be, you do receive a lot of pity at times. And because touching on what Trish had said, this is the nature of the disease. People don't understand Yeah, it's challenging to explain. I mean, myself coming from a South Asian background, I can't fully explain it in the way I would want to to some of my elderly aunts and uncles. And they just kind of assume and then they're always like, Oh, poor girl, she's so young. And look what she's having to go through. Um, And so I just kind of have to even have my mom kind of explain it in a better way to them. But even I catch my mom sometimes when she'll just Sometimes she'll see me having a rough day if I'm here at her place and she'll just try and do everything possible to help me out. And I'll be like, mom, I'm okay. I'd want to do this my, myself today. But just like Trish said, it's just, it's appreciating when someone asks if you need the help rather than expecting you need that help. And I think people that do not live with a chronic condition don't recognize that when they're seeing us having a struggle guess what? It's not new for us. This is just, it's here again. This is what we, what we deal with in our own minds and our hearts. How does it make us feel when we ask for help? And Philippa, you talked about sort of changing some of the, the self messages and. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and one of the things I now always do, if I'm on the road and I stop in at a convenience store and pick up an orange juice or a bottle of water, 
I cannot undo the tops. And now just out of habit, before, as I'm paying, I ask the person behind the counter, could you please open the top for me? And, um, and it's such a relief knowing that I'm not going to get in the car and unable to open mm-hmm. it, unable to have that drink. And for the most part, when, when I ask for um, some assistance, it's because I really need it. And I've never had anybody refuse and everybody is so accommodating. Um, so I think it also gives people the opportunity to do something for somebody else. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, sort of the self-talk or the, or the messages, it's not a sign of weakness being able to uh, request something when you need it. It's, it really is a sign of courage and strength. Um, and those kind of messages that we give ourselves become more positive and affirming rather than uh, negative and uh, diminishing. I think I have a lot of trouble asking for help. And I think it responds to my, uh, or it, it kind of reveals the response I get a little bit sometimes from others. Um, uh, Cause I'll, I'll struggle through something just to do it myself. And then maybe I get comments uh, or I get, I get looks, you know, like, why, why can't you do that? Or why, why are you having so much trouble doing some normal daily activities? Right. And, uh, or if, or, uh, or if I do talk, to someone about their arthritis, they're, I get a dismissive response, right? And, and they say, they, uh, um, well, it's, it's part of getting older, wait till you're my age, right? So yeah, yeah any, any kind of those pains uh, or stiffness or loss of mobility uh, gets labeled as arthritis. And, and uh, I agree with Trish, like the uh, conversation communication is a big part of it, just to explain what you're really dealing with, just so people understand. And I think also that being able to have conversations like this and for people listening, listening to these videos, I often think that someone who is newly diagnosed is just going to be able to be able to hear some people that have been walking and living, living with this for quite some time and to see that there is, there is a, a a chance for it to change and a lot of it is driven by by how how we feel and how how we inter interact with others i think i think to in just speaking um to that point as well um i think as people living with a chronic disease or chronic illness um you know it's it is it it behooves all of us to become resilient and and i think by nature of the fact that it's a chronic disease we do become resilient and so I know for me, like I've, I've been a lot of years, you know, young years when I've had my arthritis and um, I've tried to take from it the positive things. Like I remember years ago um, listening in a conference to a rheumatologist that simply said to everybody in the room, because everybody in the room was with arthritis or related to somehow arthritis or in that field, um, that the people with arthritis learn early how they can do things that are going to assist them as they age into life. And, you know, like, like I might need a grab bar when I'm in my forties, as opposed to when I'm in my eighties, but you know, like I did a renovation on my bathroom 10 years ago and I put in a grab bar. So I'm really safe. And I bought a car that I can just slide into no more dropping down into a car or having to climb up. I just do a twist, bam, I'm in and over, but it's that kind of thing. And so I really, work on that. I personally work on that. And I play into that. And I play into that even when I'm talking to people too about, yes, I have a chronic disease, but um, you know what, I need some help sometimes. And I kind of give people the license to let them know that I'm going to ask them in advance for some help. And they can then also respond or not. And then I know who I'm dealing with. And so, so I really feel that like I said, I just think it behooves all of us living with the disease to empower ourselves and to get resilient quickly. And maybe it needs to be an arthritis 101 that we all need to go to and then reattend every year, once a year, just so we can, you know, put all those things into our backpacks. So mm-hmm. that's it. have all the different, uh, different tools that we can, mm-hmm. that we can rely on. Yeah. I have to say that as a rheumatologist, I'm constantly amazed about how resilient our patients are and how all of you living with various forms of arthritis, you always amaze me with your resilience. And, you know, I think it is part of the 
process of learning to live with the disease and everybody is at different stages of it as you go through it and you, you talked about grieving the loss and uh, but certainly your ingenuity at doing things and figuring out ways of doing things and, and the resilience is, 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 is really quite, quite remarkable. But mm -hmm. I really liked the discussion earlier around AIDS and I find it's always a challenge for me to, to convince or discuss with patients using visible AIDS. I find, especially early on, there's a lot of resistance and I try to spin it in a in an enabling way, as opposed to feeling like you're diminished because you're using a cane to look at this as, as a tool in your toolbox that actually allows you to, to, to do the things in life that you enjoy doing. So you see it as an addition to your life as opposed to a, dimini a, a, a diminution, yes. you know, that you're, it's not, it's, it's enabling you, it's a tool and it's, it's, it allows you then to, 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 to do some of the things that you want to do. But I loved how you, you uh, put it, Philippa, and I'll definitely keep that in mind. And I love the personalizing, <laughs> make it part of your life, have fun with it, sort of normalize it. So you get rid of that sort of stigma around it. To get rid of that stigma is very helpful to the mental health aspect mm -hmm. of living with a chronic condition because we've as we've touched on in some previous conversations the there is uh, sometimes a, a, a toll on mental health with that and if you're feeling marginalized and and that having a lot of of stigma that's going to weigh heavily so this is a skill that we uh, a resilience a a tool that is really beneficial to learn and to navigate through Trish, you talked about the impact of chronic disease and mental health. I think for me is when I was younger, um, I went to a lot of arthritis talks and I didn't really relate to a lot of it. Even though I was living with arthritis, um, I thought I would be dealing with a lot of things later on in life. And I was actually quite surprised when I had my first fog or funk where I felt disconnected um, overwhelmed by the pain and just the challenges. Um, and I think once I got through that um, and recognized that it was part of the disease um, and it can happen, it might not happen, but um, I think for me is going to different talks and also talking to friends and family. Um, when I was younger, I actually didn't talk to anybody about my disease. And a lot of people didn't even know I had arthritis because I hid it so well. And then there was parts of my life where I couldn't hide it anymore. So that's when I started sharing with friends or family. And it took a while to convince or get them to understand and have awareness um, about arthritis. Because one of the things I remember is family gatherings. And I sometimes had to say no because I knew I didn't have the energy or the ability to go to that function. And, you know, it, I had to kind of make those choices and some of them were hard choices, but um, when you're dealing with chronic pain um, and disability, um, you find ways of pacing yourself. So one of the first things I learned was my three P's and I mm. preach this all the time. My three P's of joint protection, planning, so my week, I plan my week. I have an idea of kind of when it's going to be my high energy days and my lower energy days, what my days are going to be like, how busy they are. So planning ahead. Then I also pace myself. So I'm actually better at taking breaks in the day or having one day that I'm going full speed and then maybe the next day I don't plan anything because then I have a down day to recuperate. Um, so I've learned to pace my husband loves it when I'm gardening because I make about five or six garden stations. I do 20 minutes at pruning, 20 minutes at weeding, 20 minutes doing different things. And I come around. So I'm always doing something differently in those, you know, in the day. And then also too is the last P is um, prioritizing. Mm -hmm. So I've learned to find out what's really important to me and what brings me joy um, what things I struggle with. And then I've made better choices, I think, in the last several years than I did previously. 
So I think having some tools, as Dr. Lakai said, in my back pocket, or someone said backpack, I think it was Carrie. Um, I think those three Ps were help, helpful for me, is planning, prioritizing, and pacing. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm Pollyanna, but I see arthritis, having uh, developed arthritis as a gift. <laughs> and, um, and despite some of the challenges that I've lived through, the gift is I view life and, and the people in it in a much different way. I am so grateful that I'm alive and able to do the things I am able to do. And that um, the enjoyment that I get, um, because my daughter was about eight when I was going through a very difficult time and and being diagnosed. Um, And and she's now 27. Um, But the, the gift of being able to raise my kids and have them in my life and see the world through their eyes that I wouldn't have, I would have taken for granted, I think, um, until I developed arthritis. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I think, uh, and that helps a lot to have that, that grateful attitude. And I feel the same way, like just uh, being able to go for a hike with the kids and and, and be that active or, or just uh, finish a bike ride, you know, feels great, right? And, and that helps. Mm-hmm. Uh, the body too, right? As, mm-hmm. as a medicine. So. I don't want any groups or individuals to be stigmatized and particularly not those of us that are living with arthritis. I think for me is um, I've had to learn how to deal with my own stubbornness or my own pride. And um, I like to do things under the radar. I like to be behind the scenes. Um, and at social gatherings, um, my husband and I learned a trick um I would give him a look that I got stuck in a sofa or a chair that I couldn't get out of and I didn't want to look like I'm struggling to get out of that chair so um he would come across the room cross his arms I would cross my arms and we would just he would just pull me up or I would help and he would pull me up and we stood up and we kind of just stood there for a minute and then we would move on and we tried to do it subtly that it didn't look like Mm -hmm. it was a big you know, big hurrah. Look at that romantic couple linking (laughs) arms. So I think you learn. And I think when your spouse or your partner kind of gets you and understands that they don't want to make a big deal of it. And I don't like having a big deal done, but um, we learned how to do little things like that to make it easier. But I'm usually pretty good at scouting out chairs. I'm I look for the firmest, (laughs) the ones with armrests. I look for chairs that I know that I can get in and out of that I don't look like I'm, you know, having difficulty. Mm -hmm. So I, there's sometimes those couches fool you. And I've been stuck in a couple of those couches. And, um, you know, I've had to teach my son, actually, he was in his teens. And uh, he actually, he knew what my dad, my husband was doing, his dad. And he came over one time, he said, Mom, do you need some help? I said, yes. So he did the same thing. He crossed his arms because he'd seen his dad do it. So, you know, having family around that, Mm. They notice what's, what you're going through, but they don't make it a big thing. And I think for me, that's important. I like that. That is a, that's, that's a, a very good way to, uh, to be able to have that, that dignity and that, uh, that, re- that res- respect. I was going to say, Trish, just to your comment, I usually decline a chair entirely. Oh, do but, you? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But if I get a stu- a stuck in a couch, I don't think my wife can pull me out. But uh, my my boys are almost old enough to pull me out. So yeah, I, I got to hold out a couple more years and I'm fine. Yeah, well, give it a try. Crossing the arms actually gives you more strength than just pulling straight on. We found that out by trial and error. <laughs> so I sense an instructional video in the works. <laughs> Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us in this conversation today. I really appreciate the insight and the openness that everyone brought to the table. And I hope that those that are listening and watching have found this encouraging and supportive. And again, we are here once per month having conversations with people just like you living with arthritis. Thanks so much. And we will see you next time.